Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Frederick Coolidge. He's professor of psychology and co-director of, the, uh, co-director of undergraduate education in psychology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. He's the co-editor of uh, um, Squeezing Minds from Stones, Cognitive Archaeology and the Evolution of the Human Mind. We already had Dr. Karen Lee Overman on the show, so now we have the other co-editor here, Dr. Coolidge. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Okay, great. So uh, one thing that I found interesting when searching for your work a little bit, because I also search for other sources apart from the book, is that you do work in neuropsychology. So we have neuroscience and we have psychology. So what is neuropsychology about? What are the kinds of topics that it deals with? Um, In general, neuropsychology is an investigation of brain and behavior relationships. Mm -hmm. So sort of like, you know, what does this uh, part of the brain do? What's its function? And so it, just generally, it's brain. Be, we're studying brain behavior relationships. If the word clinical is in front of it, clinical neuropsychology, it strongly suggests that they're understanding brain behavior relationships from the perspective of brain disease, injuries, uh, um, inherited diseases like epilepsy, uh, closed head injuries, HIV affecting the brain, dementia. So we understand how the brain works from in clinical neuropsychology from a perspective of brain damage. What can we learn about the brain from brain damage? Um, If it's just uh, sort of plain neuropsychology, then it might, and cognitive science, neuroscience, they often get their information from studying normal people. You know, what? what's the extent of digit span? How many digits can you repeat if you're just a normal person with normal brain uh, functioning? And so what you'll do is set up norms for, for cognitive behavior on normal people in neuropsychology. But if it says clinical, you're, you're more certain that they're using brain damage models to understand the brain. Mm-hmm. But then we also have evolutionary neuropsychology. So, uh, I mean, what does the evolutionary part of it adds to the picture? Yeah, um, specifically, I went um, when I was writing my book, this book, Evolutionary Neuropsychology, that um, just came out this February, this year, 2020. Mm I looked for, I was looking at titles and, and I had to, the choice of two titles. And when I looked at evolutionary neuropsychology, I saw that there was only one place on the web, on the internet, that somebody had used that phrase, that those two words. So I liked it for that reason, that it hadn't been used much. And so my uh, use of the word means that I'm interested evolutionarily in brain behavior relationships, how they evolved. So how when we started, for example, with a brain this big three million years ago, this is probably the shape and size of an Australopithecine brain, uh, who are most are one of our most distant ancestors three million years ago. How did it end up like this? That is a modern human brain. Modern human brain. Mm -hmm. And so how did it end up like this from this? And what happened in terms of shape changes and size changes and what behaviors resulted? So my book is subtitled um, An Introduction to the Evolution of Structures and Functions of the Human Brain. And I start with the, the very first uh, probably prototype for a brain is I argue in my book that the nucleus of a single cell is akin to the brain in a body. Mm-hmm. So the nucleus takes up a tiny amount. You know, our brain takes up 
2% of the volume of our body, but it runs everything, right? When they say, when they say they're brain dead, it's a, it's a official sign of death, even if the body lives on, because you can't live without your brain running the, the many activities that we have. So um, that's what I do in the book. I trace the prototypes for brains from a nucleus to accumulations of cells and how they differentiate and um and and so that's evolutionary neuropsychology anything with evolving brains and and changing function great does it have anything to do with evolutionary psychology because i mean evolutionary psychologists i guess they don't deal directly with neuroscience with the brain they are more interested in let's say, trying to understand the cognitive mechanisms, the information processing mechanisms that we evolved and trying to understand what are the kinds of challenges that we were exposed to during our evolutionary history and that led to the evolution of our uh, repertoire of behaviors. So the, does, does it connect in any way with evolutionary psychology or not? A little bit, but not much. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because it should. But I find, um, which is controversial, I warn you, <laughs> that I find evolutionary psychology rather narrow. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, they're, they're, they're fiercely defensive of the things that, that informed modern behavior were sexual reproductive, reproductive strategies, differing reproductive strategies between men and women, and who we sacrifice for. It's called kin altruism. And those are kind of the two commandments. And, and also they put, you, you can't look at group behavior as having anything to do with our evolution, which I completely reject. And they say, no, it must be interpreted in an individual, on an individual level, and you must not promote any group mechanisms. And these are their commandments. Well, I find that way too narrow. I think you know, behavior is obviously broader. Certainly those things influenced our behavior, but they're not the only influences. So I really find evolutionary psychology could be more applicable, but the way it's practiced, it's rather narrow. So would you say you are a proponent of group selection, genetic group selection? Absolutely, I would. And, and I think this is the reason, that when we had um, Lucy, our most known distant ancestor, so here's a replica of her scale, uh, with a brain that I just showed you, a, a rather small brain, the size of a modern chimp, okay? And um, she um, lived in trees, in nests, for protection because she was small, three feet tall, 60 pounds. So she lived in a nest in a tree, slept in a tree, probably made it in trees. And we know she had her babies in trees, in a nest. Okay, that's three million years ago. Two million years ago, we start getting this, a vast increase in the brain, Homo erectus. They lived on the ground. Now you still needed protection from predators, but there's a limit to how many nests in a tree you'd have. Otherwise, if there were more nests, it would attract predators, right? They'd wait on the ground for these uh, hominins to come down from the tree, right? So how did Erectus protect themselves? Large group numbers. When they hit the ground, we're pretty, we suspect that we went up from groups of 20 to 40 to groups of about 100, 110. Okay, now, what happened at that point? We're, like in evolutionary psychology, was it every individual for themselves and each one of us? No, we developed social brains at that point. We think that this expansion in brains is that you needed to keep track of people when you have 110 people, a big group, you need to know who your friends are. You need to know who your enemies are. And do we know that they had a social hierarchy? Well, of all extant primates, we're primates. 
of all living primates now, human and non-human, there's a hierarchy, a social hierarchy. So you have to know to negotiate through the hierarchy, who's the boss? Who do you follow? Who's your friends? Who's your enemies? So there was this natural selection for those members of the group who could keep track of the other group members. Mm-hmm. And so and that's why I see. How do, how do we know about those aspects of, for example, Homo erectus sociality? I mean, is it through comparative anatomy, through comparative, uh, comparative brain anatomy, for example? Is it through the rem- archaeological remains that are left behind? How exactly? Yeah, it, it, it's both. So you're going to use... Um, We can use uh, modern genetics to determine lineages. We can use the archaeological um, artifacts that they left. For example, here's, uh, this is a real artifact. Um, That's because all of these stone tools, uh, since they're stone, they preserve real well. So probably 99% of all stone tools ever made uh, are still in existence. So it's not hard to find them. So here's one, 2.5 million years old. Here's one, 100,000 years old. You can see a real difference. Mm -hmm. So so we can suspect, you know, that brains got bigger, they changed shape, and we know now in, in modern human studies what these parts of the brains do from very sophisticated physiological monitoring, like fMRIs. Put somebody in fMRI, they tell them, hey, I want you to think about your best friend. And they see brain activity in the parietal regions. So we know from the insides of the skulls, we can make, we can create through uh, CAD programs, computer assisted design programs, we can figure out what the shape of their brain was. And we can figure out how the shapes changed across hominin evolution. And we know it changed. And we know the artifacts that they produced got more sophisticated. And so to the point where about 40,000 years ago, somebody made this an ivory statue about a foot tall with a lion's head and this sort of enigmatic little smile, probably tattooed stripes on the arm. This is 40,000 years old. Mm -hmm. So now we're pretty certain that the artifacts were getting way more sophisticated than this. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, that figure, it corresponds more or less to the period that some people call uh, the cognitive revolution, where many art, many artistic artifacts and things associated with religion and so on started appearing a lot. Sorry about that. I got a phone call. Um, yes, this coincides with that revolution. They they found in a place in France. Um, a lot of these artifacts. In fact, they got even 15,000 years later, this is 25,000 years old, really sophisticated. And so, and this was also made of ivory. These are both replicas, by the way. Um, So that we know that the modern minds were fully in place and probably had fully modern reasoning at 40,000 years. So they called that culture of the art and lots of personal ornaments, they called it the Aurignacian culture. And that's because there seemed to have been a cultural explosion starting about 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, coinciding with um, that that change was we do know that a gene from the microcephalin family, the microcephalin genes is a family of genes that regulates brain growth. Okay. And you probably have heard of microcephaly, tiny brains. Mm -hmm. That is a mutation in the microcephalin family. 
that causes really tiny brains in, in, in a normal size skull. And, and of course, those people are, are, are tremendously intellectually challenged. Um, so we know that a gene in that family, not the microcephaly gene, but another gene came online around 80,000, 60,000 years ago. Could have been more recent, but probably as distant as 80,000 to 60,000 years ago. And that gene seems to have regulated brain growth and changed shape. The authors of that study said it probably had a phenotypic change. That means the genotype changes, the gene comes online, but it probably regulated or influenced a behavior, not just a structure, but a behavior. And they said, maybe it influenced memory, maybe it influenced personality. So that, now we've got genetic evidence. We've also got the anthropological evidence that brains change shape. So by 40,000 years ago, we have the fully modern shaped brain. And, and look at the difference between this modern, fully modern brain and a Neanderthal living at the same time. A bigger brain, longer, flatter, a different shape. The, this supraorbital torus, the eyebrow ridges, probably mean nothing. Um, I, I do have a co-author, Thomas Wynn, who anytime we're traveling, he's quite attracted to anybody with a large supraorbital torus. But we, but we do suspect that it had no cognitive function. It was probably pure genetic drift. Neanderthals had been reproducing by themselves for over a half a million years. They developed the, uh, a mutation that enlarged that, that supraorbital torus. Yeah, it's interesting that you, you've shown the Neanderthal skull because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate regarding uh, the extinction of Neanderthals. I mean, do, do we know if they were as intelligent as Homo sapiens or were they not as intelligent and that could have played the role in their extinction because of, let's say, competition. Yeah, you're probably aware that there's probably two camps here about Neanderthals, especially their extinction. And, and the one camp, I call them apologists, Neanderthal apologists, who say they were exactly like us and they behaved like us. And if evolution flipped a coin 1,000 times about 100,000 years ago, that 500 times you and I would be Neanderthals talking to each other which, with intelligent conversations, and Homo sapiens would be extinct, that it was purely fate. And if you say that Neanderthals were different, you're being racist. You're being unfair to human types that are simply not here because it was fate. But the problem I have with the Neanderthal apologists is they will never, ever address these brain shape differences. And what were the brain shape differences? Smaller brains in us, larger larger uh, cerebellum. We had a larger cerebellum than uh, Neanderthals. We had larger parietal lobes. The parietal lobes expanded. We had smaller occipital lobes that do vision. They will never address those issues. So they just say, oh, it was pure fate. That's, they were just like us. And if you say there were brain differences, they're kind of forced to say, well, that didn't matter. And of course, my stand is that those brain shape differences, the expansion of parietal lobes did matter. And, and that was subject, was visible to natural selection. What was it specifically? I suspect there was a couple things, but this um, uh, um, microcephalin gene that came online and, and changed the shape of our brains 
and, and change the, the, the growth such that brains over the last 100,000 years in Homo sapiens got smaller, about 10% smaller than Neanderthals. And 10% smaller than Homo sapiens living 200,000 years ago. So this is sort of a, a, a hybrid, at least it looks morphologically like a hybrid, but this is probably Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. And, and brains were changing shape from that time. So these brains were as large as Neanderthals and they got smaller. And we got this expansion in the parietal lobes. So what did that mean ultimately? It probably meant now, Neanderthals were robust, and they had really thicker bones. If I had a femur of a Neanderthal and a femur of a Homo sapiens from 100,000 years ago, you could immediately tell the difference. Neanderthals were stockier, sturdier, and they suspect just to walk, it took more calories. But you had to get the calories from meat. Now, Homo sapiens liked meat. We liked hunting, too. But Homo sapiens were thinner, uh, taller, and they described their skeletons as more gracile, you know. And, and so what we had to do is we couldn't rely on brute strength. We had to rely on how can we extract calories from the environment, being clever so we don't get hurt. So while Neanderthals had big thrusting spears and hunting with big thrusting spears 100,000 years ago, Neander uh, Homo sapiens started to hunt with bows and arrows. That's safer hunting than walking up to an animal and stabbing it. And it's very dangerous to do that. We, we started developing atlatls, which are spear throwers. It's a, like a piece of wood that you put on the back of a spear and you can throw it and you can really whip that spear much faster and farther. So we were developing these ways of hunting that were not as dangerous. And that's because I think where when you make a mental picture of something. It's in the parietal lobes. And imagine you can do mental trial and error. I wonder if we hunt this way, what would be the outcome? I wonder if we hunt this way, what could be the outcome? And then we could choose the safer hunting outcomes. So I think bottom line is we could extract more resources from the same environments. Neanderthals, because of their bigger brains, needed more calories. Even though your, your brain only takes up 2% of your body. It, it uses up about 25% of your calories. It's a very expensive metabolic tissue. So we could extract more calories from the environment from different sources. The poor needed meat, mm -hmm. big meat. And there's some places where it looks like the Neanderthals were hunting they find deer bones split open. They find horse bones split open. They find mammoth bones split open. And Ricardo, they find human bones split open. Neanderthal bones. Neanderthals were eating other Neanderthals. And they were, and they were cannibalizing them the same way they process deer. So it's, it's unlikely that it was like a, a ritual, you know, like you conquer your enemy, so you eat your enemy, you know. It, it doesn't seem ritualistic because they, they butchered them the same way they did a deer. And that suggests, and that's a good strategy in a way. You're living in, in, in Europe. You're living in Asia, right? There's these little bands of Neanderthals. You're all hunting big meat. How do you reduce the competition? You kill them. Right? And you kill them and eat them. Even better. A bonus. So you've got these tribes of Neanderthals all through Europe and Asia, and they're eating each other. They see another Neanderthal tribe and they eat them and they kill them. It's a very effective strategy. It reduces competition for limited meat. In come Homo sapiens 45,000 years ago. They're not eating each other, they're wearing jewelry. They've got clothes woven. They've got beads. They're painting in caves. They, they know how to extract, and they, and they have much less a desire to eat one another. Well, now, this Neanderthal strategy is going to be a bad one. 
It'll no longer work when you've got competition that doesn't eat themselves or eat one another. So it was a confluence of things. One is Homo sapiens came out of Africa. So these, so the other side, we, we talked about the Neanderthal apologists. They were just like us, but they absolutely never will address brain differences. And they won't say that there were cognitive differences as a result. But my feeling is that these brain differences did matter. I didn't even talk about a very interesting one. Inside the skull, you can see the, the, the places inside a skull that lead to the brain, okay? One of them, the two eye sockets, and one of them, the foramen magnum, where the spinal cord comes up into the skull, right? right. But there's another one where the nose comes in. And if you looked on the inside of the skull, if we had an inside cut, you'd see this little plate with perforations. And it's called the cribriform plate. In modern humans, the cribriform plate, the size, is correlated with the size of the olfactory bulbs. Okay? So the smaller in modern humans, the cribriform plate, the smaller the olfactory bulbs. Guess what? Neanderthals had a smaller cribriform plate, which suggests that they didn't have perhaps the same taste and smell sensitivities that Homo sapiens did. They might have been at a disadvantage, but the advantage might be that you could eat human flesh and the smell of burning human flesh might not have bothered you as much. And the taste might not have bothered you as much because you had a smaller olfactory bulbs. So smaller cerebellum, smaller olfactory bulbs, smaller parietal lobes, I think this had consequences for their reproduction and they had consequences for their extinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but it is kind of interesting. Way, you showed it's some actually... artifacts there in terms of studying human cognition from archaeological artifacts, is it that we can derive directly some or uh, some conclusions about the cognitive abilities of a particular species or individual from the tools that they were able to produce? I mean, for example, if we know that to produce a certain kind of tool, they had to follow a sequence of steps. Can we infer from that some cognitive abilities? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I, you know, I, I think I've shown you even, so these hand axes, these started to appear about um, 1.8 million years ago. And, and it's really different than this one I showed you. This is a, um, they call it mode one stone tool. And, and what they did, this goes back 3 million years. Okay. And what they would do is they'd have a, a stone tool, a, a piece of stone called a core, and they'd, and they'd knock off sharp flakes. So the first stone tools go back about 3.3 million years to Lucy, the Australopithecines that I showed you. And they also, they usually have this bottom that's flat. It's called a glob butt. And, and they probably use that for... Uh, breaking up nuts or hard things to eat, maybe even breaking bones. And they use these sharp flakes to get meat. But you can see over since 1.8 million years ago and 100,000 years ago, they got better. They got way more sophisticated. And, and really interesting, Ricardo, is that, and this is a real one, um, Notice they call it bifacial, so it looks like the same for both sides. But look how pretty the stone material is. It is they, they chose the stone material kind of to, 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 to make the stone tool prettier than it needed to be. They call that overdetermined, where you spend more time on the tool um, than you need to. 
Also, characteristic, see this edge, how it goes back and forth? It's called a sinuous edge. And that means it's very sharp. It can cut really well. I cut modern boxes. I have one that's been made. Uh, so I don't feel if, if, if it breaks, I'll, I'll feel bad. This one, of course, is real. But it looks just like this. And I use it to cut boxes. Very, very sharp. So you can see a huge difference probably in the cognitive processes of, of this thing and of this one. But here's the really interesting thing, Ricardo. A lot of these really pretty ones were never used. Why would you spend all that time? And to make this sinuous edge, by the way, you have to chip this way and then chip the backside, chip this side and chip this side, chip this side, chip this side. It's very tedious, and it took a really, really good stone napper. To get good, they say it takes five or ten years. And they didn't use it. So why would they not use it? One of the leading hypotheses is it was sexual selection, that men were probably the stone nappers. And to show off to women, they would make a really pretty one and not use it because they didn't want to break it. And they would say, okay, look. You got this boyfriend over here who makes this one. You got me who can make this one. Do you, do you want to date the guy with the Volkswagen or the guy with the Ferrari? And of course, that's why they think they were unused. They were sexual selection. And women already had what men wanted. You know, that's access to sex and reproduction. So women already have that and since the woman's eggs are way more precious than sperm, there was competition for women's attention. And we think this is one of those ways, is you'll impress them with a beautiful all-purpose hand ax that you wouldn't use. So in that and, and way- who, who do we consider, consider that, that also, also uh, uh, for, uh, for more art? Absolutely, absolutely. And they, they started, including uh, they would they would choose stone material with a fossil in it where it was variegated with different colors. I, I've got one, I think, up here. Look at this one. Doesn't that look like an animal's head? Yeah. And I don't know if you can see. Can you see the colors? It's variegated. There, there's layers. They chose this thing and shipped it to make like a horse's head or a bird's head. It's still a hand axe. You can still bash things. The glob butt's still here. It's still got somewhat of a sinuous edge. See that? How it goes back and forth where they chip this way and this way. But probably it's not sharp enough to cut anything. It's probably an early art form. And Think about this, that you're trying not to impress just you're a male stone napper. You're trying to impress the women, but you're also trying to impress other men. Because, you know, again, there's a social hierarchy and you want to show that you're superior to the guy who made this. And then they started doing this. They, they started making round hand axes and again, some of them weren't used. So it's like, yeah, is this an art form? Absolutely. But you can even see, this is not natural. It, you can see where the stone napper, probably uh, starting about a half a million years ago, they started making different kinds of stone tools and, and making, they called zoomorphic, like animal shapes. And it got to the point, talk about art, Ricardo. Here's a, uh, a stone, uh, not a stone tool. It's made of ivory, and it's made of mammoth ivory tusk. It has been polished and shaped by some homo sapiens probably 50,000 years ago. Never used, has no domestic use. But when you mentioned art, this could be an art form, but also something that, you show up and somebody says, oh, look, I made this, I made this stone tool. And you say, oh, look, I made this ivory tool. Or I made this ivory artwork. So there's strong suspicions that 
stone tools started to become a form of art. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you one thing. How do we learn how, I mean, the sequence of steps that it took to, for them to craft those tools? I mean, is it that we put people to doing the same sort of thing and trying to reproduce them? Do we look at how uh, modern hunter-gatherers do it or what exactly? Yes. We um, we use these comparative methods, and that whole that whole discipline is actually called experimental archaeology. So yeah. there's this professor Lynn Hadley, and she looks at how they hafted these stone tools onto uh, spears, and she analyzes the the adhesive. And she finds it's pretty sophisticated. Neanderthals actually also used adhesives to, to attach uh, stone tools to the tips of spears. So we try to find out um, what temperature does it take, what uh, plants maybe they used, what minerals like ochre, like iron oxides. And so experimental archaeology, we also have people go in and they'll monitor their brain waves and they'll ask them to make these mode one still tools and they'll ask them to make something more sophisticated and then we look at brain areas that are activated when they're doing these tasks so we use a comparative method we use the experimental method experimental archaeology to say how did they do this what were the steps now interestingly um neanderthals started to make very sophisticated, this is not one, but, but it's like this, a, a long, thin-shaped stone tool. And what they had to do was take a big stone, and they had to shape it. They'd shape the core, and then they would knock off these single flakes, long, thin, sharp flakes. People that try to do that technique now, that Neanderthal technique, they say it takes about 10 years to get good at it. So it was very sophisticated, but they did the same shape. It's called the Lavalois technique. And they used that same technique for over 100,000 years. They never varied. Whereas we were varying, you know, the, the shapes and the sizes and the materials, it looked like they were stuck like algorithmically into, we've done it this way, we'll always do it this way. And so we don't, I don't like to say, and, and most anthropologists would shy away from less intelligent, okay? Because intelligence, first of all, it, it's a terribly loaded word, right? The connotations are that are lesser intelligent. It inflames people. Plus, Ricardo, you went to, pe to school with people that were smarter with, than you. So did I. And some of them were roundly unsuccessful, right? They had good brains, they didn't read, they didn't use it, and they went into jobs that really don't take much intelligence, right? Right. So let's avoid the word intelligence, okay? But so the, the sort of a modern uh, substitute will be this model called working memory the working memory model. And that's kind of a way of saying that we have a working memory capacity and some have greater capacity and some have lesser capacity. Um, and I use particularly this guy, Alan Baddeley's model of working memory. That is, we have a central executive that makes decisions. We hear and listen things and we can memorize new words. We can see different scenes and memorize them that's the visual spatial sketch pad. And, and we can send all of that into our long-term memory. Well, there's some possibilities now that we don't have to explain why we survived and Neanderthals didn't. We can say maybe they had different working memory capacities. Maybe they were more algorithmic and less uh, likely to make mental models for things. 
once they had something that worked, you know, an algorithm, a procedure that worked, they used it. And they didn't vary much. Now, really interesting, too, is when we look at what are places for, are there places that contribute to modern creativity? The cerebellum has been implicated. We had larger cerebellums than Neanderthals. Did that mean we were more creative? That they were less creative? Archaeologically, we see sort of the same stone tools over 250,000 years. Archaeologically, we don't see cave paintings. We don't see, uh, uh, we see some personal ornaments, but we hardly see any ritualized burials. 30,000 years ago, they were burying children with 10,000 beads, with ivory spears that are not used for hunting, strictly decorative. And a Neanderthal burial at the same time will be a rock on top of a Neanderthal. Now you can say, oh, that was a tombstone. That represented the soul. But it also could represent that if the body stinks, you put a rock on it. Mm -hmm. so, by, by the way, since you mentioned the cerebellum again, I, I wanted to ask you, could the cerebellum have anything to do with uh, hunting skills? I mean, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't the cerebellum also connect with uh, things uh, having to do with movement, balance, and stuff like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that was its original adaptation, a second brain that could run your motor systems. And, and control, especially fine motor movements. Now, it looks like this Lavalois technique that Neanderthals did for those long, thin flakes, we're sophisticated. Like, you cannot tra tra train a chimpanzee, our now closest relative genetically, you can't train them to, to make sophisticated stone tools. They can... They can make stone tools, but they makely break a rock on a rock. That's it. And they can use a sharp flake, but they can't make anything more sophisticated. So we have to say that the cerebellum in the inner toss was sufficient to make really sophisticated stone tools, but not much variation. You know, no bows and arrows, no addle addles. Not much variation, not much creativity. So I would say they had sufficient size, cerebellum, to make sophisticated things, but they tended not to. They tended to be sort of pragmatic. Look, this works. Why do we need to do anything else? And, and in that way, I would attribute largely that lack of creativity that we see in the archaeological record for, for Neanderthals I, I would say it's probably the cerebellum played a role. Mm -hmm. Could it have something it to do something with the kinds with of the environments they lived in, or, for example, the resources they had at their disposal, for example, different types of rocks, wood, and things like that? Yeah, um, they they do find that when, when you look at Neanderthal sites now, and there's like a over 400 sites in the world that they found where Neanderthals lived, um, they, there's just, there's plain old differences. Some of them are deal with fire, like their hearths, where they'd have fire. Doesn't look like could reach the same high temperature that Homo sapiens hearths did. Um, and the stones that they choose, the material they choose, tends to be more local. Whereas Homo sapiens, it looks like they were getting material up to a thousand kilometers away, over 600 miles away. Now, how would you get material like that? And, and some people suggest that they were trading, that you wouldn't go 600 miles just to get a pretty rock, but you could go a couple hundred miles and trade with somebody that's 300 miles away from you. So you've gone a couple hundred miles, you find some people, you trade with them. Well, to, to be, to trade with people, you, you, they could not possibly speak the same language. So they had to be able to gesture. 
They had to be diplomatic. Like, I'm not going to eat you. I'm not here to eat you. I, I want I want more rock like this, and, and I will give you rock like this. And they and so they had to be acting diplomatically. It doesn't look like Neanderthals were doing that. It looks like when they came upon another Neanderthal group, there's just too many instances where they ate them. <laughs> there was no diplomacy. They just said, ah, another meal. In, in one place where the largest Neanderthal uh, cannibalism took place, it was they found the largest Neanderthal ever. Huge skull, huge body size for a Neanderthal. Um, and they found a baby whose skull had been scraped and they ate the brains. So they could see that the, the stone tool that they used was scraping out the brain. And, and two young juveniles, you know, children that they ate. So they ate the biggest Neanderthal ever, and they ate the baby, and they ate the infants, children. Mm -hmm. And this was mm -hmm. Neanderthal cannibalism on other Neanderthals. Yeah, in, in terms of, of the evolution, evolution of cognition, and perhaps trying to explain some of those differences between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, I mean, I've had on the show uh, anthropologists like uh, P uh, Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd and they have a theory where they say that um, probably the reasons why we had to develop such complex culture uh, and basically the reason why we evolved cumulative culture is that in the Pleistocene, it seems that there were lots of environmental fluctuations. I mean, the climate changed a lot. And so we were exposed to conditions where we basically had to be more, let's say, creative. Could it, could it have something to do with that? I mean, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I guess that Neanderthals lived mostly in Europe, Asia? Could, could it be that the environmental fluctuations were bigger in Africa where Homo sapiens originated? Yeah, I, I think there is no question that these, in, they call it disrupted environments, you know, like <laughs> the volcano blows up, a uh, flood comes, that, you know, the ancestral environment was difficult. And so it would, natural selection would select for those who are flexible, right? Who can handle floods and droughts and volcanoes. And so that, they call it a fluid intelligence, the ability to solve novel problems. But that was probably true. It had to be true for Neanderthals. I don't think they were living in a real, it looks like they developed, evolved in a very cold environment, very difficult environment. So I think that's as difficult as a fluctuating environment. So I'm not real big on the theory because I think the environment throws enough um, uh, differences at you and difficulties at you that, that it faced Neanderthals too. But here's, here's what it makes me think of, Ricardo, is that biology places a leash upon culture. Okay, so, so here's um, my Australopithecine brain, right? And what it's going to do is it, it's going to place a leash upon culture. So let's say you get a bunch of Australopithecines together, okay? According to the theory that you just held, that you just have more members, so you're going to get more creative. But no. You, you've got limits on the brain. You've got limits on its cognitive functions. This is what you're capable of. Okay? Mm -hmm. So biology places a leash mm -hmm. upon culture. And I think it wasn't just a matter that Neanderthals ended up making the same sophisticated stone tools, but no variation, no creativity. Is their biology placed the leash upon their culture? It wasn't that they didn't have caves to paint in. They did. They just didn't think of it. <laughs> and, and, and the difference is, if you look at Lascaux and Chauvet Cave, 
incredible cave paintings. And and what you get, they'll say, the Neanderthal apologists will say, well, there was art in Neanderthals. Like in Gibraltar, they made a hashtag on the floor. And they're equivocating. I mean, they're making equivalent a simple hashtag, a tic-tac-toe engraving on a floor in a cave with the cave art in Lascaux. And by the way, the people that discovered this hashtag in, a, in probably a Neanderthal cave in Gibraltar, they said, it's evidence of symbolic thinking. I don't think so. You know, Occam's razor says, let's not jump to big conclusions. Can we explain it simpler? Could they have been simply sharpening a tool? And they went this way, and they went this way. So Occam's razor would say the simplest explanation is, is probably safer. Doesn't mean it's right, but it's probably safer. They claim that hashtag fully modern, just like the person that made this. And I don't think so. I think this is way more sophisticated cognition and cognitive processes than making a geometric figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we also have to be careful because it's very easy for us to project our own culture and, and, and to ancient cultures, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but the lesson for, for me that I take away is their biology placed the leash upon their culture and their technology. They didn't use bow and arrows. Why didn't they take up bow and arrows? Why did they never paint in caves? You know, elaborate designs of animals. Why didn't they make figurines? Well, you know, the, the alternative is, well, the environment was, was, uh, didn't challenge them enough. I don't buy that, right? The environment was challenging enough. What I suspect is that because of their thicker, cold evolved bodies, because there's less heat dissipation if you're short and stocky, that they were, they were on the verge of starvation all the time. This is what I imagine, that they're always hunting, always going out. You know, when it's really cold outside, Ricardo, I don't feel like going out even to check my mailbox, right? I, I'm such a, a, a softy when it comes to going out in the cold. And, and when I go out in the cold and I have to go out in the cold and I put on my jacket, I think of those poor Neanderthals. They're living out there in this cold and they had to go hunt. Meanwhile, Homo sapiens could extract, they could feed off birds, fish, because they didn't have that caloric need. And they had smaller brains, which required fewer calories. Mm -hmm. So I, I tremendously empathize with the poor Neanderthals. Hunt, hunt, hunt. So could you imagine, let, let's say a little Neanderthal boy, and, and he's drawing on the wall, you know? The Neanderthal father is going to say, hey, we're starving to death. We don't have time. We don't have time for you to make little figures and pictures. We got to go hunt. We need meat. And so I think their, their difficult lifestyle, because of their cognitive limits, their difficult lifestyle kind of made it difficult for them to spend any extra time, leisure time, painting on walls. Yeah. Uh, do we know if they had any clothes? I mean, because they were living in mostly cold environments. Did they wear any clothes or not? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that um, on most Neanderthal teeth, almost all of them, they're striations. Uh-huh. If you look at the teeth of Homo sapiens, they're not often, oh, this one has very few teeth, one left. There's not often those same striations. And they say, why would that be? Well, the hypothesis is that the Neanderthals would use their teeth to hold skins while they were stripping the meat off and while they were making clothing. Mm -hmm. And they used their teeth a lot. Homo sapiens didn't use their teeth as much. So, so the possibility is 
that that Homo sapiens was making using skins, making fur, but they didn't use their teeth as much. And you know, Ricardo, teeth are important, right? Mm -hmm. You have bad teeth. It, it changes your digestion, your nutrition, poor, nutri poor nutrition. So probably Homo sapiens recognize the value of protecting your teeth. Neanderthals are biting and probably getting more teeth problems as a function, but we definitely know they're more striated. And that suggests they were cleaning skins and probably using the fur to clothe themselves. Mm -hmm. Could they speak? Absolutely. We have modern vervet monkeys. They teach their young three different sounds for three different kinds of predators. They teach their baby monkeys sounds for, a, for an eagle, for a snake, or a tiger. And when they teach them the sounds and they elicit the warning like it's an eagle, the baby monkeys will come down the tree because they know the eagles will fly above and pick them off the tree. If it's a snake or a tiger, they go up the tree. Well, if modern vervet monkeys with very small brains are communicating these words, these, these sounds that have meaning, that elicit responses, Neanderthals with the bigger brains, they had language. The question is, uh, are there limitations to their language? Did they have cognitive limits? And I suspect because of the lack of parietal expansion in Neanderthals, that that part of that problem might be um, uh, um, unable to make to do to run mental experiments as as well as Homo sapiens. So remember I told you Homo sapiens could sit there and internally make pictures in the parietal lobes of, I wonder if we do it this way. I wonder if we do it that way. What happens if we do it this way? And we could sort through the consequences of various alternatives. I suspect Neanderthals weren't as good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible for us to um know how complex the language of a particular hominin species was from their sociality, I mean, their social organization and things like that, because uh, to coordinate certain activities, they would need language. Yes. And let's think about the purposes of language, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Like, one purpose is... Um, uh, if we step on a thorn, we, we go, ouch, right? Yes. So do you think Neanderthals could have stepped on a hot coal? You think they would have expressed that emotion by an exclamatory statement like, ouch, ooh, hurt, pain, whatever, you know, they had, they, they expressed emotion. And do you think when a Neanderthal mother had a Neanderthal baby that she probably cooed to the baby? You know, cooing like, ooh, baby, ooh. Yeah, so they had exclamatories. Do you think that there was a hierarchy? Like the biggest Neanderthal was probably the strongest Neanderthal and was probably in charge? Likely, right? Do you think he bossed the others around by going, hey, move, get. You know, you can use a very short phrase and, and you can command others. So they probably had imperatives. So they have exclamatories, they have imperatives. Exclamatories are expressing our emotion, usually pain or pleasure, and they had imperatives, move. Okay, and you could even see a hierarchy. Imagine if dogs were hanging around and domesticated with Neanderthals, it's debatable, but imagine if the father Neanderthal says to the junior Neanderthal, hey, move. The junior Neanderthal, who could they boss around? Uh, younger Neanderthals. What's the younger Neanderthal going to boss around? Maybe the dog. Okay. So I'm sure they had imperatives. I'm sure they gave commands to one another. Get away, go back, give me that. It's very interesting when they teach great apes to do sign language the great apes tend to sign the same thing over and over. And you know what that is, Ricardo? Gimme, gimme apple, 
give me banana, give me apple, give me banana, give me banana, give me banana. Okay, so I think they had exclamatives. I think they had imperatives. They could give commands. They must have had declaratives. If, if monkeys can name an eagle and a tiger and a snake differently, Neanderthals were naming things in their environment, and they probably named each other. Okay, so in that way, they were just like Homo sapiens. But what, it, what aspect of language did they, maybe they lack? I think, because of this parietal expansion, that they didn't have the subjunctives. Those are what-if statements, if-then statements. I'm not sure that they could put subjunctives together and create hypotheses contrary to a fact. What's a, what is a hypothesis contrary to a fact? What archaeological evidence might show that that person created a hypothesis contrary to reality? This one. This shows me that Homo sapiens 40,000 years ago, the Arg nations, our ancestors, um, and by the way, everybody on earth, everybody, is related to this Aurignacian culture. There's nobody that has DNA completely outside the DNA of the human that made this um, figurine. But here's, a, here's, a, here's my evidence for subjunctive thinking, for hypotheses contrary to fact, is they made a female lion's head on a human body. That doesn't, that's called a therianthrope, half person, half beast. You couldn't do that unless you could think hypothetically. Yeah. And this, this is not evidence of subjunctive thinking for me. Mm -hmm. Okay? This, this sharp, single Neanderthal flake, that doesn't show me that they could think hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Sophisticated? Expert nappers? Yes. Creative? Not so much. Subjunctive thinking, I think that resided mostly in, in Homo sapiens. Yeah. Uh, by the way, since we're talking about language, is there any evidence of language being present in species before Neanderthals and Homo sapiens? Only by comparative methods. Okay. okay. So, the, so the comparative methods would be, we, have, we had a common ancestor with uh, monkeys 20 to 40 million years ago. We have a common ancestor with great apes 15 million years ago. Yeah. They can learn signs. They don't have the vocal apparatus, but they can learn signs. And so we suspect that the neural foundations for supporting language were there, but probably not sophisticated uses of language like the subjunctive that I just talked about, like hypotheticals. Yeah. So I am, I'm pretty certain that, um, that Lucy had some of those language capabilities, the ability to name things, predators, to boss people around, and, and, and actually to name maybe tools. That's, that's a possibility. Lucy probably had episodic memory. And that is, she could remember the time that the tiger came and ran up the tree to get them, and they barely survived. She could probably replay that episodic memory. Um, but modern human episodic memory usually includes a sense of self. Like, tell me about your graduation. Oh, I remember my parents were there, and I had a hood on. There's a sense of self. I, I wonder if they had much lesser sense of self in their episodic memories. But by the way, since we're also talking about comparative methods, um, with modern enter-gatherers, I mean, how good are they as models of ancient enter-gatherers, Homo sapiens, for example, because I mean, I would imagine that nowadays most 
hunter-gatherer tribes have already been exposed, at least to a certain extent, to modern, more developed cultures, let's say, or at least people that live in more developed uh, societies. So that could have some sort of influence. I think most anthropologists are a little bit cautious about okay. interpreting, okay? Because first of all, those people that are living in Brazil, the Paraha, they, they have the same genes we have. We're all descended from 2,000 reproducing humans in Africa 75,000 years ago. Everybody's got that same DNA all over the world, okay? Now culture might make different expressions, you know, and, and provide uh, environments provide different challenges now, but it's very dangerous to, to say, oh, we were like this or like this. And another line of reasoning for being cautious is if we look at primates and we can just look at the, the great apes that are closest to us genetically, chimpanzees and, and pygmy chimps, bonobos, right? Mm -hmm. And chimp, now they're genetically related, strongly genetically related. OK, um, chimps, when they take over a, 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 a female for breeding, they will kill the babies of that female. And the chimps solve a lot of their problems with violence, you know, usually not killing, but threatening so that you have a dominance. Bonobos, the pygmy chimps, completely different. You've heard about the bonobos? <laughs> how did they how did they solve things? Sex. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of sex. So if you just look at primates, the variation in their culture, you know, is so great that it's very dangerous to say, oh, this tribe means that we acted this way. You have to be very, very careful. So we might be able to glean something about hunting techniques about hunting tactics from modern gather hunters but we have to be really careful about saying that was the ancestral environment mm -hmm. by the way you mentioned <laughs> DNA. we also have the neanderthal dna right a little bit a, little bit. a lot of people a lot of people don't a lot of people more recently from africa have no Neanderthal DNA. Um, they have found that some Africans now, extant Africans, do have some Neanderthal DNA. Most that have um, more recent history in Europe, European ancestors, have maybe one to four percent. It can be higher in Asia, Southeast Asia. Some people have a little bit higher DNA. But the notion that we're 50-50? No. It's a small amount of DNA that we got from the Neanderthals. And it, it looks like the DNA that we got, it, it's debatable, very controversial. But some people say they gave us addiction genes, make us more likely to be addicted to drugs and tobacco. Um, so it's real debatable about what the genes that that we got from the inner talls. And, it, and it's quite possibly that the genes that we gave to the inner talls, especially when we bred, like we think any hybrid between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, any male hybrid was infertile. And, and genetic evidence tells us that. So yes, we interbred, but let's remember, it's limited interbreeding. That we only got a little bit of DNA from the inner talls. And when we had hybrids, the males were probably infertile. Mm -hmm. By the way, what about the Denisovans? That, that's another species that has been, people have been talking a lot about recently. Uh, did they interact with Homo sapiens as well? They did. And, and we do know that the Denisovans are, are Denisovans did interbreed with Neanderthals. Um, it, what's murky is the common ancestor. So some people suspect that about 800,000 years ago, 
um, and, and probably out of Africa, um, there was Homo heidelbergensis, even though Heidelberg suggests it was in Germany, that's where the first skeleton was found. And, and Homo heidelbergensis had the biggest brain ever in the history of hominids, 800,000 years ago. We went to about 1250 cc's. That's only 100 cc's smaller than modern humans. Okay, so we got this vast expansion of the, of the brain. It looks like Heidelbergensis may have given rise to Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and the Denisovans, but we're not certain. It might have been that the Denisovans were a lineage that broke off from Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. so, so, so right now, genetically, it looks like Neanderthals were more similar to the Denisovans than to Homo sapiens. So they were more closer cousins than we were. Yeah. And, and they persisted maybe, I mean, to maybe uh, a hybrids that were between Neanderthals and, 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 um, and Denisovans, maybe as recent as 50,000 years ago. But there's just so few bones right now that it makes it difficult. And I'm sure as we find more Denisovan bones, Denisovan bones, that we'll, we'll know more genetically. Yeah. So in terms of the migrations that occurred across the globe, I mean, we Homo sapiens reached pretty much all continents uh, by 15,000 years ago or something like that. I think that 15,000 years ago we were in America. Um, could, could an explanation for why we were able to reach that those other continents, like for example Australia and America, and Neanderthals stayed mostly in Eurasia. Could, uh, could it be that one of the explanations is that they weren't able to produce uh, technology that was sufficiently sophisticated or developed to be able to travel such long distances? Yeah, the, the peopling of particular islands and the peopling yeah. of Australia. Yeah. Um, one, one hypothesis, one theory, is has always been a pregnant woman on a log in a tsunami. Yeah. Okay, so the way you get to Australia is this big flood happened in Indonesia and you are a pregnant woman on the log and you made it to Australia. And then somebody else on a log, had to be a male, comes over on a log in a tsunami and now you've got a pair of Homo sapiens who can breed together. But I don't buy the argument. I buy the argument that around 100,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, we have almost fully modern minds in place. And that means that they have reasoning abilities, executive functions, that they're able to plan, organize, strategize, and predict the future. And so they would say, look at those clouds way over there. There must be a land mass over there. I can't see it. You're in Indonesia 80,000 years ago. I can't see the land. I can't see Australia. It's way too far. But I see those clouds. Oh, look. I see the sky lighting up. It looks like there's a fire over there. All this smoke, the clouds coming up from the ground. So they say, what would it take for us to go to Australia? Well, we need a boat or something that floats. We need some food. We'll bring some dogs. We'll bring a sufficient number of people and we'll go explore that place. And that's how they think Australia got inhabited by people who had full, we call them executive functions of the frontal lobes, that ability to plan, organize, and strategize, and be successful. Not only that, that if you have a problem and you've been solving it one way, you can think of an alternative strategy if your main strategy fails. So that means you're flexible. Oh, this didn't work. Well, let's try this. Well, that didn't work. Let's try this. So it looks like 
fully modern minds came and peopled Australia with with fully modern reasoning abilities, which we would call executive functions. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me so just ask me you just one last you. question. We've already talked a little bit about evolutionary psychology and one of the assumptions that evolutionary psychologists make is that our minds as we have them today are the same as the minds of Homo sapiens back from the Pleistocene. Um, do, do you agree with that? I mean, you talked, for example, about modern human minds, talking about, I don't know, perhaps 75,000 years ago or so. Uh, do you think that from, from that time onward, we haven't acquired any new cognitive processes, cognitive abilities, I mean, for example, through culture or other yeah. things? It's a, it's a great question. When I was writing my book, this evolutionary neuropsych book, it took me about four years. You know, they say, um, you know, I realized trying to stay up with all the discoveries of brain changes, even in the last four years, is difficult. So I'd never be done with my book, right? Because there's this change, that change. And so I'd never be done with my book. For example, I wrote a whole chapter on the hippocampus that, that makes memories, okay? And I finished the chapter and I see an article and it says there are neurons in the hippocampus dedicated to recognizing one's own species. They're called conspecifics. And I went, ah, that's important. I got to put it in. So I had to bring back the chapter, add it, okay? So it's, they say, don't start a land war in Asia because it's so big, right? Land war would be ridiculous. So I thought when I was ending this book, I thought, don't write a book about the brain, you know, current brain knowledge, because as soon as you finish the book, parts are going to be out of date. But I wondered, Ricardo, how to end my book. And, that, and your question, I didn't know how I'd end it. And your, and your question is a great one because it, it leads me to the end of my um, of how I was going to end the whole book. And and so as I was writing, I was saying, how am I going to end it? How am I going to end it? I'm on the last page. And it, I said, I was influenced by this Thomas Nagel, a philosopher, mm -hmm. 1974, mm -hmm. who wrote a classic paper, What is it like to be a bat? And Nagel proposed that it's impossible for humans to know what it feels like to be a bat. He said, we can study bats, we can analyze their, their echolation system for movement and flight, we can categorize their behaviors, we can explore them anatomically, but we'll never know what, it, what a bat feels like to be a bat. In that same way, um, I said, so what would it be like to understand a Neanderthal? And I would say, you got to be cautious. You have to be cautious. I also ended it with Wittgenstein's, um, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand it. And, and, and so I ended on the note that, what does that mean? You know, Wittgenstein, it's a funny thing, you know, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand it. And that's because he, I, my interpretation was that there's an incommensurability between languages. You have something that can't be translated. And, and there's no good word for it in another language, right? So you have this basic incommensurability between languages. But I think that exists too, Ricardo, in humans, in people. What's it like to be an old person? You know, you can put on uh, glasses that make things difficult. You can stuff your ears so you can't hear. You could, you could um, stuff your nose so you can't taste. Is that what it's like to be old, Ricardo? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. So what would it be like to be a Neanderthal? I'm not certain. I don't know how they felt. I know that, you know, I, I'm intrigued by them. I have to say, I love them. I make money off them because I wrote a book, How to Think Like a Neanderthal. I make, I make profit off them. Not a lot, a little bit, but 
I love Neanderthals. I'm intrigued by Neanderthals. But what was it like to be a Neanderthal? I don't know. I'd be careful. Yeah. Okay, so let's end on that note, Dr. Coolidge. And before we go, would you like to mention some places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, if you just Google Frederick Coolidge, there's like 9 million hits. And not all of them are me, of course, because we had a president, Calvin Coolidge. But the first ones on your Google search will be me. So it's really easy to find my websites by just Googling my name. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will leave some links in the description box of the interview. And again, oh, I can send you some of those links. I can oh, send you some links. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, and again, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show and let me leave an invitation on the table to talk more about your your last book, the Evolutionary Neuropsychology, right? Because uh, to be honest, I wasn't aware of it, so I haven't read it yet. And maybe there are some uh, interesting questions that uh, I left out. So. You know, the questions that you generated, Ricardo, were beautiful. It covered a lot of the things that I cover in the book. So... I appreciate the interview, and uh, if you have any further questions, let me know, and I'll send you links so that your uh, listeners and readers and watchers um, can uh, can look up some of these articles that we're, we've talked about. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Deza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Franz, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.